When I had attained the age of 17, my parents resolved that I should become a student at the University of Ingolstadt. I had hitherto attended the schools of Geneva, but my father thought it necessary for the completion of my education that I should be made acquainted with other customs than those of my native country. My departure was therefore fixed at an early date, but before the day resolved upon could arrive, the first misfortune of my life occurred, an omen, as it were, of my future misery. Elizabeth had caught the scarlet fever. Her illness was severe and she was in the greatest danger. During her illness, many arguments had been urged to persuade my mother to refrain from attending upon her. She had at first yielded to our entreaties, but when she heard that the life of her favourite was menaced, she could no longer control her anxiety. She attended her sick bed. Her watchful attentions triumphed over the malignity of the distemper. Elizabeth was saved, but the consequences of this imprudence were fatal to her preserver. On the third day, my mother sickened. Her fever was accompanied by the most alarming symptoms, and the looks of her medical attendants prognosticated the worst event. On her deathbed, the fortitude and benignity of this best of women did not desert her. She joined the hands of Elizabeth and myself. My children, she said, my firmest hopes of future happiness were placed on the prospect of your union. This expectation will now be the consolation of your father. Elizabeth, my love, you must supply my place to my younger children. Alas, I regret that I am taken from you, and, happy and beloved as I have been, it is not hard to quit you all. But these are not thoughts befitting me. I will endeavour to resign myself cheerfully to death, and will indulge a hope of meeting you in another world. She died calmly, and her countenance expressed affection even in death. I need not describe the feelings of those whose dearest ties are rent by that most irreparable evil, the void that presents itself to the soul, and the despair that is exhibited on the countenance. It is so long before the mind can persuade itself that she whom we saw every day, and whose very existence appeared a part of our own, can have departed for ever. That the brightness of a beloved eye can have been extinguished, and the sound of a voice so familiar and dear to the ear can be hushed, never more to be heard. These are reflections of the first days. But when the lapse of time proves the reality of the evil, then the actual bitterness of grief commences. Yet from whom has not that rude hand rent away some dear connection? And why should I describe a sorrow which all have felt and must feel? The time at length arrives when grief is rather an indulgence than a necessity, and the smile that plays upon the lips, although it may be deemed a sacrilege, is not banished. My mother was dead but we still had duties which we ought to perform. We must continue our course with the rest and learn to think ourselves fortunate, whilst one remains whom the spoiler has not seized. My departure for Ingolstadt, which had been deferred by these events, was now again determined upon. I obtained from my father a respite of some weeks. It appeared to me sacrilege so soon to leave the repose, akin to death of the house of mourning, and to rush into the thick of life. I was new to sorrow, but it did not the less alarm me. I was unwilling to quit the sight of those that remained to me, and above all I desired to see my sweet Elizabeth in some degree consoled. She indeed veiled her grief and strove to act the comforter to us all. She looked steadily on life and assumed its duties with courage and zeal. She devoted herself to those whom she had been taught to call her uncle and cousins. Never was she so enchanting as at this time, when she recalled the sunshine of her smiles and spent them upon us. She forgot even her own regret in her endeavours to make us forget. The day of my departure at length arrived. Clerval spent the last evening with us. He had endeavoured to persuade his father to permit him to accompany me and to become my fellow student, but in vain. His father was a narrow-minded trader and saw idleness and ruin in the aspirations and ambition of his son. Henry deeply felt the misfortune of being debarred from a liberal education. He said little, but when he spoke I read in his kindling eye and in his animated glance a restrained but firm resolve not to be chained to the miserable details of commerce. We sat late. We could not tear ourselves away from each other, nor persuade ourselves to say the word farewell. It was said, and we retired under the pretense of seeking repose, each fancying that the other was deceived. But when at morning's dawn I descended to the carriage which was to convey me away, they were all there my father again to bless me, Clerval to press my hand once more. 
my Elizabeth to renew her entreaties that I would write often and to bestow the last feminine attentions on her playmate and friend. I threw myself into the chaise that was to carry me away and indulged in the most melancholy reflection. I, who had ever been surrounded by amiable companions, continually engaged in endeavouring to bestow mutual pleasure, I was now alone. In the university, whether I was going, I must form my own friends and be my own protector. My life had hitherto been remarkably secluded and domestic, and this had given me invincible repugnance to new countenances. I loved my brothers, Elizabeth and Clerval. These were old, familiar faces, but I believed myself totally unfitted for the company of strangers. Such were my reflections as I commenced my journey. But as I proceeded, my spirits and hopes rose. I ardently desired the acquisition of knowledge. I had often, when at home, thought it hard to remain during my youth cooped up in one place, and had longed to enter the world and take my station among other human beings. Now my desires were complied with, and it would indeed have been folly to repent. I had sufficient leisure for these and many other reflections during my journey to Ingolstadt, which was long and fatiguing. At length the high white steeple of the town met my eyes. I alighted and was conducted to my solitary apartment to spend the evening as I pleased. The next morning I delivered my letters of introduction and paid a visit to some of the principal professors. Chance, or rather the evil influence, the angel of destruction which asserted omnipotent sway over me from the moment I turned my reluctant steps from my father's door, led me first to M. Kremp, professor of natural philosophy. He was an uncouth man, but deeply imbued in the secrets of his science. He asked me several questions concerning my progress in the different branches of science appertaining to natural philosophy. I replied carelessly and partly in contempt mentioned the names of my alchemists as the principal authors I had studied. The professor stared. Have you, he said, really spent your time in studying such nonsense? I replied in the affirmative. Every minute, continued M. Kremp with warmth, every instant that you have wasted on these books is utterly and entirely lost. You have burned your memory with exploded systems and useless names. Good God, in what desert land have you lived where no one was kind enough to inform you that these fancies which you have so greedily imbibed are a thousand years old and as musty as they are ancient? I little expected in this enlightened and scientific age to find a disciple of Albertus Magnus and Paracelsus. My dear sir, you must begin your studies entirely anew. So saying, he stepped aside and wrote down a list of several books treating of natural philosophy which he desired me to procure, and dismissed me after mentioning that in the beginning of the following week he intended to commence a course of lecture upon natural philosophy in, his, in its general relations, and that Monsieur Waldman, a fellow professor, would lecture upon chemistry the alternate thing that he omitted. I returned home not disappointed, for I have said that I had long considered those authors useless whom the professor reprobated. But I returned not at all the more inclined to recur to these studies in any shape. Monsieur Kremp was a little squat man with a gruff voice and a repulsive countenance. The teacher, therefore, did not prepossess me in favour of his pursuits. In rather a too philosophical and connected a strain, perhaps, I have given an account of the conclusions I had come to concerning them in my early years. As a child, I had not been content with the results promised by the modern professors of natural science. With a confusion of ideas only to be accounted for by my extreme youth and my want of a guide on such matters, I had retrod the steps of knowledge along the paths of time and exchanged the discoveries of recent inquirers for the dreams of forgotten alchemists. Besides, I had a contempt for the uses of modern natural philosophy. It was very different when the masters of the science sought immortality and power. Such views, although futile, were grand, but now the scene was changed. The ambition of the inquirer seemed to limit itself to the annihilation of those visions on which my interest in science was chiefly founded. I was required to exchange chimeras of boundless grandeur for realities of little worth. Such were my reflections during the first two or three days of my residence at Ingolstadt, which were chiefly spent in becoming acquainted with the localities and the principal residents in my new abode. But as the ensuing week commenced, I thought of the information which Monsieur Kremp had given me concerning the lectures, and although I could not consent to go and hear that little conceited fellow deliver sentences out of a pulpit, I recollected what he had said of Monsieur Waldman, whom I had never seen, as he had hitherto been out of town. Partly from curiosity and partly from idleness, I went into the lecturing room which Monsieur Waldman entered shortly after. This professor was very unlike his colleague. 
He appeared about 50 years of age, but with an aspect expressive of the greatest benevolence. A few grey hairs covered his temples, but those at the back of his head were nearly black. His person was short but remarkably erect, and his voice the sweetest I had ever heard. He began his lecture by a, by a recapitulation of the history of chemistry and the various improvements made by different men of learning, pronouncing with fervour the names of the most distinguished discoverers. He then took a cursory view of the present state of the science and explained many of its elementary terms. After having made a few preparatory experiments, he concluded with a panegyric upon modern chemistry, the terms of which I shall never forget. The ancient teachers of this science, said he, promised impossibilities and performed nothing. The modern masters promise very little. They know that metals cannot be transmuted and that the elixir of life is a chimera. But these philosophers, whose hands seem only made to dabble in dirt and their eyes to pore over the microscope or crucible, have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. They ascend into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. Such were the professor's words. Rather, let me say such the words of the fate announced to destroy me. As he went on, I felt as if my soul were grappling with a palpable enemy. One by one, the various keys were touched which formed the mechanism of my being. Chord after chord was sounded, and soon my mind was filled with one thought, one conception, one purpose. So much has been done, exclaimed the soul of Frankenstein. More, far more will I achieve, treading in the steps already marked. I will pioneer a new way, explore unknown powers and unfold to the world the deepest mysteries of creation. I closed not my eyes that night. My internal being was in a state of insurrection and turmoil. I felt that order would thence arise, but I had no power to produce it. By degrees, after the morning's dawn, sleep came. I awoke, and my yesternight's thoughts were as a dream. There only remained a resolution to return to my ancient studies and to devote myself to a science for which I believe myself to possess a natural talent. On the same day, I paid Monsieur Waldman a visit. His manners in private were even more mild and attractive than in public, for there was a certain dignity in his mien during his lecture, which in his own house was replaced by the greatest affability and kindness. I gave him pretty nearly the same account of my former pursuits as I had given to his fellow professor. He heard with attention the little narration concerning my studies and smiled at the names of Cornelius Agrippa and Paracelsus, but without the contempt that Monsieur Kremp had exhibited. He said that these were men to, whom, to whose indefatigable zeal modern philosophers were indebted for most of the foundations of their knowledge. They had left to us as an easier task to give new names and arrange in connected classifications the facts which they, in a great degree, had been the instruments of bringing to light. The labours of men of genius, however erroneously directed, scarcely ever fail in ultimately turning to the solid advantage of mankind. I listened to his statement, which was delivered without any presumption or affectation, and then added that his lecture had removed any prejudices against modern chemists. I expressed myself in measured terms with the modesty and deference due from a youth to his instructor, without letting escape, inexperience in life would have made me ashamed, any of the enthusiasm which stimulated my intended labours. I requested his advice concerning the books I ought to procure. I am happy, said Monsieur Walman, to have gained a disciple, and if your application equals your ability, I have no doubt of your success. Chemistry is that branch of natural philosophy in which the greatest improvements have been and may be made. It is on that account that I have made it my peculiar study, but at the same time I have not neglected the other branches of science. A man would make but a very sorry chemist if he attended to that department of human knowledge alone. If your wish is to become really a man of science and not merely a petty experimentalist, I should advise you to apply to every branch of natural philosophy, including mathematics. He then took me into his laboratory and explained to me the uses of his various machines, instructing me as to what I ought to procure and promising me the use of his own when I should have advanced far enough in the science not to derange their mechanism. He also gave me the list of books which I had requested and I took my leave. Thus ended a day memorable to me. It decided my future destiny.
Okay, so um, that's chapter three of Frankenstein. Um, I've given a little activity for any key stage four students. We follow the Edexcel specification for GCSE English Language and Literature at my school, but um, every exam, every specification, every exam board has to follow a certain amount of rules. The assessment objectives are the same for everyone. So every exam will have questions where you have to analyse language and structure within it. Um, you'll need the book to do this activity, but the text is available free um, online as it's out of copyright. Um, and also Penguin Popular Classics publish these books for about a pound each. Um, so I'm sure you can get it quite cheaply on Amazon or a second hand copy on eBay. So if you look at the passage towards the end of the chapter, beginning, I closed not my eyes that night. That's about the length of an extract you'll get at GCSE. It's a few paragraphs long. Um, you may well get a question like this. This is the, how Edexcel framed the question and other exam boards will have similar. How does Shelley use language and structure to show us Frankenstein's state of mind in this extract? Um, and to answer this, you'll need to write a few paragraphs um, in answer. I would say three minimum uh, for the Edexcel specification in which this question will be worth 20 marks. Um, other exam boards I know have shorter questions, so um, you should talk to your own teachers about paragraphing in terms of the length of the exam answer here. But um, I tell my students for a 20 mark question um, in this kind of uh, anal analytical paragraphs you need to write, minimum three, ideally about five to get the very top marks. Um, also, different schools will teach you different structures. Uh, you may have heard of P paragraphs, P-E-E. -E. Um, P's paragraphs, petal paragraphs, peel paragraphs, they all pretty much do the same thing. I teach P's, P-E-E-Z, standing for point, evidence, explanation and zoom. And this quite simple structure can help you get the top marks in this kind of analytical question at GCSE. Remember the questions asking you about language and structure. So you must talk about both within your answer. So at least one of your paragraphs must be about structure. Um, when we're looking at structure, you can look at uh, punctuation, you can look at the length of sentences, there may be long complex sentences, there may be short sentences for effect. Um, when you look at language, you're looking at all those literary techniques and linguistic techniques such as repetition, alliteration, simile, metaphor, personification, onomatopoeia, um, but also the, more, the simpler ones, looking at just words and their connotations, powerful nouns, adverbs, verbs, adjectives. So using the PEEZ structure where the point would be to answer this question, Shelley uses blank, i.e. whatever piece of language or structure you want to analyse. So you're getting the technique in the very first line. Um, so you may say Shelley uses a metaphor to show us that Frankenstein is determined to succeed. Perhaps that may be your first sentence. Your evidence, the second E, is a quote from the text. Your explanation tells us how that metaphor tells us that Frankenstein's determined. And then the key part of it to get the higher grade is the zoom. In the zoom, you go back to the quote that you've already stated, you choose a key word within that quote and you zoom in on it. You talk about the connotations of that word. Why did Shelley choose that word rather than another synonym? Um, what extra depth can that give to Frankenstein's state of mind? And then you choose another quote and do another piece paragraph, making sure you've got a language and structure in your answers somewhere. Um, and that will get you a very good mark at GCSE level. So have a practice of that question, perhaps picking out literary techniques and structural techniques and thinking how would you explain how they link to Frankenstein's state of mind.